Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This is the premiere episode of my previously announced series on Z80 assembly language development, targeting the Sinclair ZX Spectrum to learn how to program a simple system starting at the very lowest level. This series will assume that you already have some familiarity with programming in a high-level language, and some rudimentary understanding of things like hexadecimal numbers and Boolean logic. If you don't, I would recommend checking out the many videos and websites out there that can get you started on those topics. And I have some linked at my GitHub repo page that's linked in the description below. So what exactly is assembly language? Every processor has one, after all, each used to various degrees by different kinds of programmers, but mostly by those that need to have low-level control over the hardware or have tight performance constraints. An assembly language can be defined as a human-readable set of mnemonics that represents a processor's machine language. But what's a machine language? That's the binary code that a processor executes from memory. So that means that an assembly language program directly represents the ones and zeros that go into the processor and tell it what to do. While languages like C or Pascal can be compiled into machine code, the result of that compilation depends on how their compilers are implemented. When you write a line of code in C, you don't know exactly what machine code that is going to translate into. You can even compile that code for completely different processors like ARM or x86 and get completely different machine code. But assembly languages are for specific processors and cannot be simply assembled into machine code for different processor families. Different processor models within a processor family may have compatibility between them, with certain models having certain unique instruction mnemonics, but generally have a lowest common denominator of machine language that can be executed by all models within the family, and use consistent assembly mnemonics for them. This lets us use the same assembler program to assemble code for multiple processor models within the same family. In the case of the Z80, it can run Intel 8080 machine language, even though it has a distinctly different assembly language, and additional instructions that aren't supported by the 8080, so you can't go both ways. An assembler is a program like a compiler that takes in an assembly program text file and outputs binary machine code. That program may run on the platform you're programming for, but quite often it is on an entirely different and more advanced machine. In that case, you would use a cross-assembler. Since it's just translating the mnemonics into ones and zeros, it doesn't matter what kind of computer is doing it. Assembly is usually a fairly quick process, but later in the series we will look at ways that it can be more complicated. For this series, we are going to use the SJASM Plus Assembler, which is free and open source and can be run on most modern computers. There are many other assemblers out there that can target the ZX Spectrum and run on the development platform of your choice, so you can use whatever you like or already have easy access to. The key thing to understand is that the Z80 assembly language will still be the same, regardless of the assembler you use. They are all based on the original assembler created by the manufacturer who put the Z, or Z if you prefer, in Z80, Zilog. As I said earlier, the Intel 8080 was the inspiration for the Z80, and the design goal of Zilog was to create a backward compatible processor that would also add some additional capability right into the chip to make building a system around it less expensive, as well as making it easier to program by providing additional instructions. To maintain compatibility, the Z80 started with the original registers of the 8080, most importantly the accumulator, also known as simply A. As the Z80 is an 8-bit processor, the accumulator only has 8 bits, that is, 8 binary digits that can be 0 or 1. For this tutorial, we are going to express binary values as hexadecimal, for the most part, so that we only need 2 digits per byte. So an 8-bit register can store a range of values from 0 to hex FF, which is the same as decimal 255. So that makes for 256 different values, or 2 to the 8th power. The accumulator is basically a single byte of memory built into the chip, and you can control what goes into it in your program. And the processor will also use it as the main register for doing any kind of mathematical or logical operation. The Z80 has the rest of the six other registers also found in the 8080, B, C, D, E, H, and L. These six registers can't be used for as many operations as the accumulator, but they do have a special superpower. 
they can be combined into three 16-bit registers, BC, DE, and HL. Furthermore, the HL register can also be used to store memory addresses, which are 16 bits for the 8080 and the Z80, and there are special instructions that take advantage of that. We'll get into those in later episodes, so make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you can learn more about them later. The Z80 also has the same program status word as the 8080, also known as F, which contains several bits that act as flags indicating different states. Also along for the ride are the 16-bit stack pointer, or SP, and program counter, or PC. These contain the addresses for the current top of the program stack and the program instruction being executed, respectively. The Z80 also adds a bunch more registers, including alternate registers for all of the legacy main registers, A through L, that can be switched out to have two separate register states, which can be useful in many cases. Beyond that is a pair of 16-bit index registers, IX and IY, which can be loaded with addresses, and instructions can use them to access data at different fixed offsets from those addresses. Also new are 8-bit interrupt vector and refresh counter registers, also known as I and R, respectively. With I, you can change the page of memory that contains your interrupt vectors, and R just keeps counting until it rolls over and causes a refresh signal to go out to dynamic RAM chips. We'll get into how all those are used in later episodes. The mnemonics of Z80 assembly language are completely different from the original 8080 mnemonics defined by Intel, which can make it a bit confusing when migrating from one to the other. This was done intentionally, as Intel could claim copyright on their assembly language, but not on the ones and zeros of the 8080 machine code. The Z80 is also different from pretty much any other assembly language by using the term load to mean any transfer of data between registers and memory. The assembler uses LD as the abbreviation for load, followed by a pair of items separated by a comma to complete the mnemonic. The first item is the destination of the load, and the second is the source. So we can expect the data identified by the second item to be copied to the first one after the instruction is executed. By necessity, the first item needs to be something writable, either a register like A or a memory address, which would be formatted as a number between a pair of parentheses. Or it could be a memory address indirectly referenced by a 16-bit register like HL, in which case it will have the register name in the parentheses. The second item needs to be something readable, either a register, a memory address, again in parentheses, or an immediate value that is right in the code and doesn't need to be read from anywhere else in memory. It will always just be the same value. There are many different ways to do a load, but just because they all use the same LD mnemonic does not mean that they all result in the same operation code, or op code, as the first byte of machine code for this instruction, then a bunch of bytes to define the destination and source of the load. Instead, the destination and source can be entirely encoded in the opcode. If you do an LD A comma B, saying that you want to load the contents of B into A, this is done in machine code with a single byte, hex 78. Anytime the program counter comes to an address that contains hex 78, it will just copy B into A, and then advance to the next byte in memory and execute the instruction there. If a load instruction contains an immediate value or an address, the resulting opcode will actually require the 8 or 16-bit value in the instruction to follow it, making for an instruction that takes up to 2 or 3 bytes in memory. For example, loading A with the value at address hex 1234 will result in the opcode hex 3A, followed by 3, 4, and 1, 2, in that order, as the Z80 is a little Endian architecture, just like most Intel chips and the 6502 family. Some load instructions can be even longer, but we'll get into that in another episode. The important thing to know for now is that there are a fixed number of variations on the load instruction, based on the number of opcodes that are used for load. Of course, there are many more instruction mnemonics, and some only have a single operand with no comma, and others have no operands at all, just the instruction abbreviation. For example, INC A will increment the value in A, meaning it will have one added to it. And RET is short for return, which will simply return to whatever code called the routine that preceded it. 
There's no need for an operand after an unconditional return. The stack will already tell the processor where to return to. It's important to remember that the number of elements in the mnemonic does not translate to the size of the instruction in the machine code. Several instructions that have no operands have two byte opcodes. While quite a few instructions with two operands in the mnemonic, like load AB, translate to just a single byte. There are even cases where the assembly instruction has a numerical operand, but that is actually just the mnemonic for an opcode that has an implicit number associated with it. So you can only use a small set of numbers for instructions, rather than an arbitrary value. So let's write our first assembly language program for the ZX Spectrum. We'll get into the memory and the hardware layouts of that platform in later episodes. But for now, we just want to do something very simple. The Spectrum gets its name for its ability to have color graphics, unlike its black and white predecessors, the ZX80 and ZX81. If you spent any time with a Speccy, you have probably noticed the color limitations, which allow you to have only two colors in any 8x8 square of pixels. This is controlled by a segment of memory starting at hex 5800. If you look at the byte at 5800, that represents the color attributes of the 8x8 square in the upper left corner of the display. Each byte in this segment contains four fields encoded into those eight bits. As illustrated here, the lowest three bits, also known as bits two through zero at the far right end, is the ink color, which is what Sinclair calls the foreground color. Let's say we want a yellow foreground, we could set this to 6, or 110 in binary. To the left, up in bits 5 through 3, is the paper color, which is Sinclair's for the background color. Red is color 2, so we can set these bits to 010 binary. To the left of the paper color is the brightness flag at bit 6. When this is set, the ink and paper colors will be the brighter versions of themselves. You can't use bright paper with dim ink, or vice versa, because you just get this one bit. So we'll go with bright and set it to 1. Then all the way to the left is the flash flag at bit 7. When this is set, the ink and paper colors cycle between each other, so that half the time the ink color is what you set for paper, and vice versa. Let's say we want to flash between our red and yellow colors. So we'll set this bit to giving us a full binary byte of 11010110, or hex D6. So let's make a program to write hex D6 to the address hex 5800. Of course, you could do this with a single poke command in BASIC, but you'll need to use decimal values, which is actually not very useful when doing a poke. Here we do a poke 22528,2, comma 214, and that will be the decimal equivalent of poking hex D6 to hex 5800, and hit enter. Then you see the corner square blinking red and yellow, so let's try doing this in assembly. The Z80 doesn't have a single instruction that can load an immediate value directly into a memory location. We'll use the accumulator as a go-between, as that is the only register that can both load an immediate value and then load a single byte into memory directly. So our first instruction will be LD space A comma dollar sign D6, which loads the immediate hex value D6 into A. The dollar sign tells the assembler that D6 is a hexadecimal number, and not some weirdly labeled variable. Then we have an LD parens dollar sign 5800 and parens comma A and that will store the value in A to the hex address 5800. Since there were no instructions in between, we can assume that A still contains D6. Then we can just return with ret, which should get us back to whatever called our code. I know that seemed like a big fire hose of information to explain a simple three instruction six byte program, but this is the basis for all assembly programming. You need to keep track of the values in all the registers and make sure that those values aren't lost before they reach their final destination. We'll eventually get through the entire instruction set and see how to use all of the different registers and ways to deal with memory in later episodes. For now, let's get our code ready to run. Here we see our code in a text editor. 
I prefer to use Atom, but you can use any editor you want, even Microsoft Notepad. But I would recommend using something that is capable of syntax highlighting for Z80 assembly. Atom has a package for that, and I'll have that linked in the README documentation for this tutorial series. That documentation, along with this code and the slides we just went through, are all in the GitHub repo linked right in this video's description. As I said earlier, I'm using SJASM Plus for an assembler, and it has some built-in macros that make it easier to create artifacts that can be loaded into a ZX Spectrum emulator, or even converted into audio tracks and recorded on cassette. To indicate the specific target system, we use the device macro and give it the argument ZX Spectrum 48, meaning the original 48K model of the Speccy, which will be our target for this series. Most of our examples will work with the later models, and even with the 16K model, but the 48K is the most common standard for Spectrum software, especially classic games. Then we have an org directive, which tells the assembler where we expect this code to be loaded in memory. We specify hex 8000, again with the dollar sign to make sure the address isn't interpreted as decimal. You can use other syntaxes with SJASM Plus, as it is very flexible and makes it easy to build code made for other assemblers. So you could replace the dollar sign with a hash, or just append an H to the number to mark it as hex. We'll be using dollar signs in this tutorial, as it's a character that has no other meaning in most assembly languages. We use the hex 8000 address, as that is the beginning of safe user RAM on the spectrum. And that gives us nearly 32k of space to work with before we run into any conflicts. None of the examples in this series will even approach that size, so this will be a consistent choice for us. Then we have a label, which is placed at the beginning of a line, with no space before it. If it were a macro or an instruction, it would need to be indented for SJASM Plus to interpret it that way. We call it start, and as it comes right after the org statement, we know that label will be assigned the address hex 8000. We then follow the label with a colon, which isn't strictly required, but it does make the code a little clearer. Then we have the three instructions we saw on the slide, and you can see here that Adam colors the instruction abbreviations and register names magenta, the numbers are orange, and special characters are white. Note that the dollar signs for hex values are colored orange as well, as that is part of the number syntax. After the code we have a line that starts with a semicolon. This is a comment which means that any text after the semicolon will be ignored by the assembler. Comments are crucial in assembly language, especially for the Z80, as it can be difficult to follow the code without them. This comment is just there to say that we will be generating a snapshot file for our deployment strategy. Then we have another built-in macro called SaveSNA, which generates a snapshot file based on the arguments. The first argument is a string for the snapshot file name, in double quotes, which we'll call load.sna. The second argument is the address to run from after loading the program into memory, so we'll just pass it the start label. And that's it for our program. Let's go see how we can build it. Building this code is very simple with SJASM Plus. If we have the SJASM Plus executable in our path, we can just call it from the command line, SJASM Plus and pass it the file name of our assembly file, load.asm. It finishes quickly as there's not much to do there, but if we do a directory listing, we'll see that load.sna was generated right here, just as we specified with the save SNA macro. Now we're all set to run. Let's fire up the emulator. I'm using Zasarix as it runs a little better on Linux than Fuse, which is the leading open source spectrum emulator. It also loads up snapshot files created by SJASM Plus very easily, so we'll just do that by hitting F5 to bring up the menu, then selecting Smart Load. Then load.sna from the Lesson 1 subdirectory of our workspace. And there it is. The code was loaded and run from the start address, and now we have that blinking square. We can't go back to basic from this snapshot, but in later episodes, we'll look at other deployment schemes that better emulate how programs are loaded on a real specy. That's all we're going to be going through in this episode, but we have a lot more in store. The Z80 instruction set is huge, especially for an 8-bit processor, 
and there's a lot to go through, starting with the different addressing modes, which will be the subject of Lesson 2. Please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out. And please like this video if you learned anything, and let YouTube know that you want to see more tutorials like this. If you can't wait for the next episode to go public, join our Patreon community and see my videos ad-free as soon as they are uploaded, just like the people you see here. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.